in any way useful. Or it's annoying and problematic. Recording again. And so as I mentioned, we're, we'll continue with looking at air pollution con concentration mo models focused predominantly, uh, really entirely today on the Gaussian dispersion model. Just a couple reminders. Um, modeling homework uh, is due next Monday at 11.59 normal time. Just a reminder, there's quite a few computational problems. My advice is kind of work through as we go. So you should be able to do all the box models. Uh, you should be able to do <clears throat> some of the Gaussian dispersion model problems. That'll make it much easier and you won't be scrambling um, at the end to try and finish all of the problems. So take a look at those and if you have questions, let me know. I've got office hours again this afternoon from 2 to 3.30. Uh, I'll be on Zoom, and you've got the link for that. So <clears throat> we'll um, happy to answer any questions. Also a reminder, in a re uh, report for the semester project is due on April 6th. Uh, make sure you're working through that with your group. You should have made contact with all your group members. Hopefully you've kind of worked through in terms of how you can gather the information you need. Interim report is really focused predominantly on gathering information, providing the background information that you, you'll need in order to write your proposal and make the recommendations. There is a rubric posted on Lon Kappa, so take a look at that in terms of grading. That'll give you a sense of how the grading will be done. Um, and then just a reminder, participation question will open on Friday. They're open for, <clears throat> be open from Friday through Sunday. And typically, and again, as again with this week, they'll be really more focused on kind of where you are in kind of my, or my attempt to try and help you as much as I can. <clears throat> so, Let's just move forward. Okay. Keep my laptop a little bit. Um, okay, so we left off here looking at uh, some conditions and how they affect <clears throat> um, pollutant concentrations. So we're moving, we want to move forward. What the goal now is let's look at what the MAC or how would we determine that maximum concentration. So we mentioned that we often have a plume. It may, for instance, with a condition like here, okay, where <clears throat> We're looking at, for instance, a very unstable condition. So, okay, let's look here. We'll actually start. Notice here that the concentration is equal to zero. And then that plume will increase, concentration will increase, and then it will rapidly decrease. Okay, the reason for this is with a unstable condition like this what you have and we mentioned this is a looping plume so what we have here is we have a rapid increase and we have a condition here we're very close to the stack we have essentially negligible concentrations as that plume rises it brings with it that pollutant. We have a maximum concentration here. And this is what we're looking at determining. That's the con maximum concentration that 
a person could be exposed to if they, in this case, they were close to the stack. If you have a more stable condition, you're gonna get something that looks more like this. So your peak is much further away from the stack and the concentration is lower, but it's gonna take a lot longer for that gluten to disperse. Now we can determine this using a graphical approach or a, but it's, entire, it's basically an empirical approach. One thing to note here, if you're using this graph is one, what we have is we have a log log plot. So this is the maximum distance. And this here is CU over Q max. I don't know. It's cut off on my screen. I'm not quite sure if it's cut off on yours or not, but I wanted to make sure. Okay, so we can use this. It'll make more sense um, when we work this next problem. But the major thing to recognize is it is a, it is a log log plot. Alternately, we can use this equation. And we have this equation right here. This is actually from the FE reference handbook. So if you're taking the FE, and you have a problem like this, this is the equation. They don't have the, um, <clears throat> actually, no, they, sorry, they do have that figure, but they also have this table. So let's, it'll make much more sense as we work through a problem. So let's go through and we're gonna look at the same problem that we had before. So let's just, oh, sorry, here. So what do we have? We had a situation before where we had a ability class B. We had an effective stack height of 300 meters. We were told that the wind speed at the effective stack height is 4.9 meters per second. So we have that, that condition. Now what we want to do is we want to be able to determine the distance downwind. So it's, we want the distance downwind where the SO2 reaches its maximum level. So if we're thinking about this, basically we have this situation where this is x direction, this is the concentration. We're looking for both the distance here downwind, and we want C max. Okay, so those are the two <clears throat> pieces of information that we're looking for. So let's go to this figure here and use the highlighter. So what do we have? Okay, we have stability class C. So this is this, we have stability class C we have an effective stack height of 300 meters. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna read across here and we're gonna read down. Okay. And that <clears throat> the value that we read from here Okay, so this value here is about 1.5 times 10 to the minus six. So that's this value right here. And then we're gonna read across here. And <clears throat> this, let's read it. So that's one, two, three, four. So that is four kilometers. So basically what this graph tells us is that this term CUQ max is 1.5 times 10 to the minus six inverse meters squared, and that the maximum concentration occurs at a distance four kilometers 
from the stack. So what do we have? We have C U H over Q max is equal to 1.5 times 10 to the minus six inverse meters squared. So we got that from the graph that was from figure 7.52. <clears throat> that we can actually calculate using the equation. Um, if we do, just that would be exponent of minus 1.97 or 8 minus 1.9980 times ln of 300. Question, where did I get that from? Let's go back here. And we have condition C. We have A, B, C, and D are zero. So let's look, this is just this equation right here. And we only have to worry about A and B because C and D are both zero. So that's where this comes from. <clears throat> and if we calculate that, that is equal to 1.575 times 10 to the minus six inverse meters squared. So then C max is equal to 6.47 times 10 to the 8 micrograms per second. That was from the previous problem. So let's just add that over here just to remind us that that was from, the, from that previous problem divided by 4.9 meters per second times 1.5 times 10 to the minus 6 inverse meters squared, and that is equal to 198 micrograms per meter cubed. And previously, we calculated this as 2 point, two, sorry, 206. That was what we calculated the other day at um, four kilometers. It's pretty close. And if we use the equa equation for this CUH divided by Q max, we would get 208 micrograms per meter cubed. So it's all pretty close. If you remember, we said that our models, we were hoping that our models are plus or minus 50%. So we've actually achieved much greater accuracy with this than well within this plus or minus 50%. Questions before I move on? Uh, I have a question. Sure. Can you elaborate on um, where that 208 comes from? Uh, the 208 comes from if I were to use this value right here. So if I plug in the 1.57. Okay. Okay. So this is just using the equation form to find. Oops, I don't know why it's. Sometimes the, the uh, tablet. <clears throat> some funky things, doesn't it? Oh, cute. Okay, so what if I if I use this equation, then this value here, I'd get the two point up, the two hundred and eight. Okay. All right. Thank you. Make sense? Yep. Okay. Cool. So it's basically whether I use a graph or the or the equation form. No, in Lan Kappa, anytime you have these problems, use the equa The equation is what is used in Lan Kappa because I can't teach Lan Kappa how to read a graph. Um, so I have to code everything using the equation form. So that it's true across the board. Anytime in, in a Lan Kappa problem where you're, you could use a graph or use an equation, Lan Kappa is coded with the equation. 
I wish I could teach Lon Kappa how to use a graph, but I haven't figured out how yet. So we we'll use the equations. Okay, so the next thing we, what we want to do is we want to be able to predict how, to what extent will that plume rise and Let's just, so if we have a stack, I'm going to draw the stack here. What you may find, and uh, I should have added back some of those figures, but if you look back in the meteorology si slides, you see some cases where we have basically a fanning plume, where there isn't much rise in that, in the plume as it exits the stack. Or we may have a situation where we have a stack, and here you have this more looping plume, so the plume rises, and basically what's going to happen is it may loop, but the rise in that plume is going to decrease with distance away. So it's kind of going to get smaller and smaller, and eventually you're not going to get much rise at all. But what we want to do is we want to calculate this initial plume rise. And that term is referred to as delta H. Yes. Now, why does it rise? One is density. Your plume, the temperature of those gases as it leaves the stack, is typically much greater than that of the surrounding air. So the density of your stack gas is less than the surrounding air. So it's more buoyant, so it wants to rise. Um, <clears throat> it can also have a lower molecular weight. So again, it's typically lower molecular weight, typically less dense, so it's more buoyant. <clears throat> it also has momentum. The velocity of your stack gas and the velocity of the surrounding air okay, may, <clears throat> may be greater than, maybe less than. So it could be greater than, could be equal to. Typically, if you have low wind, so typically it's greater, so the stack gas velocity is greater than that of the surrounding air that plume is going to rise higher. So if it's greater, so then it will typically rise higher. If it's less than, so now you've got high wind, it'll rise less to a lesser extent. So in this case here, where we had this fanning plume, possible condition, Okay, so is that what we had was a high wind condition. So it may have, the stack gas may have either been, velocity may have been similar or less than the surrounding air, and you have that fanning. In this case, you have a low wind situation, so this could be a low wind, this could be a high wind. This is just possibilities. And those differences, but that plume has momentum. As it's leaving the stack because of its velocity, it has momentum, and that momentum decreases with distance. And because of that decrease in distance, that's why you see this height of this plume rise decreasing. Okay. There's <clears throat> frictional losses. The air has, creates friction um, and, or drag, and that's going to reduce momentum. <clears throat> so we look at the temperature of the gas. We're going to look, we'll look at 
the velocity of the stack gas, we'll look at the velocity of the air, and the, lastly, what we'll look at is we'll look at the stability of the atmosphere. Um, so those are basically the factors that we'll consider, and those we'll take into account to try and model plume rise. There's a number of models. The one that we will use is the Briggs model. It was developed in the 1970s. Um, it is the one that is used in most of the atmospheric models. So anything, typically anything approved by EPA is going to use the Briggs model. Um, but if you compare <clears throat> these various different models, you'll find that they actually vary quite a bit uh, in the estimates of plume rise. But this is the one that we will use. <clears throat> and I skipped here. Okay, so in order to estimate plume rise, so this, so what we want is we want to estimate plume rise. What we'll determine is two parameters, one that's based on buoyancy and the other that's based on stability. So basically, remember we said that buoyancy was a major factor and stability is also a major factor. So this buoyancy term includes in it a term for gravitational acceleration, the inside radius of the stack, the stack gas velocity, and the ratio of the ambient temperature to the stack gas temperature and make sure that you're using Kelvin for those. Okay. The other term that we use is the stability parameter and this is a function of gravitational acceleration, the ambient temperature, the environmental lapse rate, and the dry adiabatic lapse rate. Now notice, okay, here your temperature, this is your ambient temperature. We said that this was in Kelvin. <clears throat> this is in degrees C, but recognize that both of these two terms are a difference. So because it's a difference, the difference between two temperatures in Kelvin and two temperatures in centigrade are exactly identical, so that's Kelvin actually cancels. So we can use degrees, degrees C per meter here, and that's because what we're actually measuring is not a temperature, but a change in temperature. And the change in temperature in degrees C and Kelvin are equal. major thing here are the units. Okay? You must use these units. It's a different equation. If you're going to use U.S. standard, these equations are derived with metric units. So make sure you're using metric. Now this set of conditions are for stable conditions. So we're looking classes E and F here. And we're looking at stability classes A through D here. So we have different set of equations depending on stability class. So here, if, we're, if we have neutral or unstable conditions, so stability classes A through D, again, you're still going to use that buoyancy term. There is no stability term. So the only thing you're using that buoyancy parameter term here. And then what we want is the distance downwind to that final plume rise. So we, remember we said the plume rise is decreasing with distance due to <clears throat> decreasing momentum because of the drag on those gases. So X sub F is the distance downwind, 
And we have two sets of equations here. And those equations depend on F. So you can see here, depending on F depends on which of these two equations we will use. So let's do an example. Actually, leave it here. Okay, so we have a large power plant with a 250 meter, st <clears throat> meter stack. We have an inside radius of two meters. We have an exit velocity of the stack gas at 15 meters per second. We have a temperature of 140 degrees C or 413 degrees Kelvin. We have an ambient temperature of 25 degrees. We have winds at the stack height of <clears throat> five meters. And we want to estimate the effective height of the stack, both if we have an atmosphere that is stable and we have a temperature and environmental lapse rate of two degrees C per kilometer, and we have a atmosphere that is slightly unstable, class C. So we'll look at what the stack height, or oh, sorry, what the plume rise would be under those conditions. I'm going to add a slide here so that we have <clears throat> some place to write. So we have, let's, so we have H is equal to 250 meters. So that was our stack, <clears throat> our stack height. We have an inside radius of two meters, just going through the same parameters. A stack velocity of 15 meters per second. A temperature of the stack gases of 413 Kelvin. We have a ambient temperature of 25 degrees C or 298 Kelvin. We have a <clears throat> temperature, uh, sorry, a velocity of at the stack height, the stack height of five meters per second. We have a delta T over delta Z or environmental lapse rate of two degrees per kilometer or two over a thousand. degrees per <clears throat> per thousand meters. So for stable conditions, S is equal to G over T sub A, delta T over delta C plus 0 0.01 degree C meter. So this is 9.8 meters per second squared over 298 Kelvin times 0 0.002 plus 0 0.01 and that is equal to 0 0.0004 <clears throat> seconds, inverse seconds squared. F, so our buoyancy parameter is equal to G R squared F sub S one minus T sub A over T sub S. So that is 9.8 meters per second squared times two meters squared times 15 meters per second and velocity times one minus 298 over 413. And that is equal to 134 meters to the fourth 
seconds cubed. Okay, so then delta H is equal to 2.6 F over U, U sub H S to the one third, and that is equal to 2.6 times 164 meters to the fourth seconds cubed over five meters per second. That's 0 0.0004. <clears throat> seconds to the minus two. And that is equal to 113 meters. Okay, so that would be the plume rise for the first set of conditions, so a stable atmospheric condition with the plume, with the environmental lapse rate. So this is our environmental lapse rate of two degrees C <clears throat> per thousand meters. Okay. And it's positive, it's actually increasing. So on the other hand, if we have, and let's just add another set of, oh, oh, debating, yeah, let's add another set of slides. This gives us a little more space. Okay, so then we have slightly unstable. We have class C. So now we'll go back and let's go back and look at these sets of equations. We calculate it F, we calculate F the same way. And we have a condition here. What do we have? We had F equal to 164. So that's greater than 55. So let's go back here. So we have F is greater than or equal to 55 meters to the four S cubed. And we already calculated F as 164. We've calculated that. So that means we can now calculate a distance to the final plume rise of 120 times 164 to the point 0.4. So that is 923 meters. So it's almost a kilometer before that plume stops rising. It's going to keep kind of bouncing around for almost a kilometer. And in this case, now delta H is equal to 1.6 F to the one third x sub f to the two-thirds over u sub h, and that is equal to 1.6 times 164 to the one-third times 923 to the two-thirds over five, and that is equal to 166 meters. So in this case, and I didn't calculate it before, we'll go back, is equal to h plus Delta H, so that was 1,250 plus 166, and that is equal to 413 meters. If we go back here, <clears throat> we had H H is equal to H plus delta H, and this is equal to 250 plus 113. So what do we have? 363 meters. Okay. So for the stable conditions here, that plume rise is not as great as it is for the unstable conditions. And that's what we showed before. Okay, so for a more unstable condition, you're going to see a greater plume rise. For stability class A, we'd expect even a greater plume rise. Any questions? Okay. So let's move on. And this is, this is a special case here. 
So in this case here, we have a temperature inversion. So we've talked about that before. So what do we have here? So basically, you've got, we've talked about that we've calculated mixing heights. So <clears throat> this here would be your mixing height. So what happens? That plume rises till it gets to here. And then it kind of, you can think of this as a boundary condition or a wall or, and basically it can't go any further. So what happens? It's going to reflect back down. So we actually, we talked to, remember we, when we derived the equation for, or <clears throat> first wrote that equation for the Gaussian dispersion equation, we said that if we were at ground surface, here, because of that reflection, we eliminate the, denom the two in the denominator for the concentration term. So what do we have? We have a reflection here. We have a reflection here off that boundary layer. <clears throat> and you can essentially here, you essentially almost have constant concentration because basically you've got the convergence of those two um, reflections. The <clears throat> two terms that we'll need to add or that we'll add here that are important is this term right here. So this is our dispersion coefficient in the z direction. based on the mixing height. So we have a distance to where the beam, where the plume intersects that boundary layer. We will also use two times that distance. And we have a new equation now for the dispersion coefficient. Now, in, I'm going to change it, colors here. In this region here, okay, we can model this exactly as we did before. The plume hasn't yet hit that boundary layer. It doesn't reflect back. So, the dispersion modeling is no different in that pink range. Then we're going to have, we'll change colors. This, this area here, we begin to have this reflection. And then we have this area out here that I'm coloring. So beyond that two times <clears throat> that distance to where your plume intersects that boundary and boundary layer. So here, out here in this blue region, we're going to assume that we have complete mixing. So out here in this blue, we have complete mixing. We have this green region where we have the, the two reflections, and then we have the pink region, which this pink region we're going to model as before. So there's no difference in the modeling that we'll use there. So in this case, the equations are a little bit different. So this is, sorry. so this is the equation here that we will use where x is greater than or equal to 2 times x of l. If we're in 
that region that we colored green, this yellow, this green region here. Okay, so actually, let me change colors. Let's go back here, the green. So that's okay. If we're in this region here, then we're going to interpolate. So basically, what we'll do is we'll calculate the concentration at x sub l. We'll <clears throat> calculate the concentration at x equals 2 x sub l, and we'll interpolate between those two. So we actually don't have a good modeling equation for that. We simply do an interpolation. Okay, so this one here, let's kind of color coordinate here. So let's go here. Let's use the pink again. Okay, so for this condition, we use the Gaussian dispersion equation. In that green region, we'll use the interpolation. And then if we're in that bluer region, that's where we're going to use this equation. And I'm going to change this and I want to do it blue. Okay, so it's kind of that's that blue region that we'll use this equation. Does that make any sense? Okay, so let's, we've got a, should have time to finish this, okay. So let's look at this problem here. Actually, I'll keep. Okay, so we have a stack. We've got an effect, effective height of 100 meters. We've got a emission rate. And I'm going to change this. I should have changed this on the slides. I'm going to change that to three meters per second. And we're going to instead do this on a cloudy night. Just recognize we just changed that. We're gonna do we're gonna look at a condition instead of a clear summer day, we'll do this on a cloudy night, and we have a wind speed of three meters per second. We have an inversion layer of at three three hundred meters, and we want the ground level SO2 concentration. And we want it at a distance downwind twice that where the reflection begins to occur from that inversion. So what we're looking for here is we're looking where x is equal to 2 times x sub l. So it's at that set of conditions. So let's just do the same thing. We'll add a new slide here. And then we can work through. So we have H equal to 100 meters. U sub A is equal to 3 meters per second. L is equal to 3. <clears throat> and actually, I'm going to just make sure this wind speed here, um, just to make our life easier. Let's go back here, this is U sub H. We're going to set this as equal to U sub H. Okay. So this here is U sub H, not U sub A. So let's just make it just makes the problem a little simpler. Otherwise, we would have to calculate U sub H. And we have Q is equal to 2 times 10 to the 8 micrograms per second. And let's see, we have cloudy night. Okay, so we have C. <clears throat> We're looking at its X of, of um, question is which is the Gaussian 
plume equation. The Gaussian plume equation, I'm going to just go all the way back, is just to answer that question. Um, this is the basic Gaussian dispersion equation. Okay, so just to answer that question. So this is the most general form. We looked at multiple forms of the equation on Monday. So it depends on the conditions. Typically you're looking at ground level. So this is what you'd use. You'd use the ground level um, concentration. If you're looking along the center line, then that equation simplifies even more. And then this would be the equation that you would use. So um, let's go, what I'll actually do is nine through 11 um, to make it a little more straightforward for you is what we just brought this. Okay, this are, is slides nine through 11. So depending on your condition, you're gonna use the equations on slides nine through 11. So that's what we would do there. And this is equal to Q over two I to the one half U sub H dispersion coefficient in the Y direction. <clears throat> um, times L. And so we have first thing we have the dispersion coefficient at x of l, and that is equal to 0.47 times l minus h times 300 minus. 100, and that equals 94 meters. Okay. Now, <clears throat> this is where, okay, what we want to calculate is what is X of L. The way we're going to do that is we have the equation Before, that we used before that said that our dispersion coefficient in the z direction is equal to c times x sub d plus f. If we have, and we're not going to be able to finish this today, so we'll finish this on Friday. But basically, what we need to do is we need to go back to the early parts of the lecture where we had <clears throat> the we could determine the stability class and we could determine this equation so we have a cloudy night let's assume that the wind speed at ground level is roughly the same as what I gave you, in which case we'd have stability class E. Okay, and I'm gonna, what I want you to try and do between now and Friday is based on that, question is stability, we have stability class E. What I want you to do is see if you can think through how would we calculate X sub L? Okay. Can, you, can you go through and calculate X sub L for this set of conditions? Okay. And I gave you this, actually, you could even calculate U sub A. And and move forward from there. Okay, so what, let's try between now and Friday, let's see what you can do. 
Um, see if you can calculate this. We'll finish that, and then on Friday we will finish. Um, We've got one more problem, and I think what I'll do is we'll have some time. So on Friday, I'll add a couple extra example problems so we can go through a few more examples that hopefully will help with um, mastery of this material. So let's stop there. And um, I'll be online for office hours in about a half an hour, and happy to answer any more questions at that point in time. Or if you've got any questions, I can 